I'm Shashi Deshati. I'm CTO of Factly, one of the earliest fact checkers from India. Apart from fact checking, we work on various open source journalism tech that you can check for information on factlylabs.com. Today we'll discuss one of the applications, WitCheck. WitCheck is an open source web platform that makes video fact checking more standardized for fact checkers, easy to read and understand for audience, and scalable for platforms and fact checkers. The application can be used in cases where claims being fact checked are part of videos such as political speeches, news content, documentaries, any other type of commentary, manipulated content, etc. WeCheck is built to help three major stakeholders, fact checkers, audience and platforms like YouTube, Facebook, Vimeo, etc. Fact checkers need to identify the timestamps where claims are made in the video that is to be fact checked. They enter these timelines in WeCheck and the specific claim being made at the specific time. WeCheck then enables them to write their research for these claims. Claim review schema is populated automatically for published fact checks. For the audience, this will be a completely new and refreshing experience. If it's a political speech, especially the ones made during election campaigns, the reader will be able to watch a specific clip where the claim is made, read the claim and fact check all at one place without having to go back and forth in the video. The audience can read the fact check claim by claim where they can watch the clip and read the fact check in a refreshingly new UI. They don't need to watch the lengthy videos just to see where the claim is made. Audience can jump to a certain claim in the video by clicking through the list of claims and also get a graphical view of all the ratings for the claims. WeCheck solves an important problem for platforms as far as misinformation with the videos is concerned. It is immensely useful for platforms like YouTube because all the information entered in WeCheck is exposed as an API, which can be used to addi add additional context and information in the videos presented on the platform. All in all, WeCheck makes this entire process a part of fact-checking workflow. Hence, without any additional effort, the entire ecosystem will benefit. WeCheck comes in three forms. First, it is integrated with Factly's native fact-checking CMS called Tega. Second, organizations can deploy it as a standalone application. Third, organizations that are using WordPress can install it as a WordPress plugin. In this demo, you will see the entire workflow for a standalone WitCheck instance, but the process will be similar in all the three forms. Let me walk you through a few entities that we use in WitCheck. Claimant is a person or organization who makes a claim, or it could be the platform where the claim is made. These are the few values that you can add to a claimant, name, featured image, tagline, description, etc. Rating is a final assessment made regarding the claim. Different fact checkers give different ratings to a claim based on their fact check. Which check comes with default ratings, but the organizations can create their own rating system. These are the fields that you could modify in a default rating or add to your custom rating. This is the list page for uh, fact checks on the publisher side of things. Here you can see the title, the number of claims that are fact checked within this fact check and uh, different ratings that are given with how many claims for each rating. You can click on the preview and here you can see the same information on the top. And uh, one of the things that you can do is you can click on uh, the claim directly and the claim automatically jumps in the video above without having to watch the entire video or you could actually navigate through the claims here as well and uh, the claims changes in the video uh, again. This is how the end user website will look like. This is the default theme that comes with WitCheck but if organizations choose to have a different kind of a UI, they can create their own UI as well. In the default theme, the list page will look very similar to the publisher view. But when you click on a wit check, the UI is a little different in the details page. Like you can see, here is the title. This is the title of the video. It happens to be the same title that we used here, but this is the title of the video. 
how long the video is, what's the original source. This is all uh, very pulled uh, directly from the backend and uh, the number of the claims and how many claims in each rating. Once again, you can click on any of these to jump uh, to the claim directly or uh, the user can uh, navigate through the list of the claims here as well. This is pretty much the description of uh, the fact check and the review sources. Let's go ahead and add a sample fact check. You can add fact check uh, by clicking the new fact check here. Uh, we can add uh, the title here. And uh, the next field is where uh, the video URL goes. So let's give a sample video from my uh, YouTube here. So as you can see, once you put the video URL here, the video is automatically loaded and starts playing. The supported video platforms for standalone bit check are uh, YouTube, Facebook video, Vimeo and other uh, popular uh, video platforms. For the WordPress plugin, uh, it only currently supports YouTube and Vimeo for now. So as you can see, the video starts playing and uh, you can either, uh, for us to add new claims, you can start by adding uh, the time here for the start and end times of the claims here. Or uh, while the video is playing, you could uh, just enter the start and end time while wherever uh, the video is currently. And now once you hit on add claim, we can add uh, the rating to that. And uh, claimant here uh, is Donald Trump. And uh, let's add some sample uh, data for claim here. And uh, fact is pretty much uh, what is the what the publisher thinks uh, the fact is for that particular claim. Uh, let's add some <coughs> sample description here. So the claim date and check date, all these fields are uh, mandatory fields. That is to enforce uh, the best practices of fact checking. And uh, review sources are also mandatory. Let's put some uh, sample review sources here. You can add uh, multiple review sources, but for right now, we'll uh, just add one. So this is how uh, you add a new claim. If you want to add uh, multiple claims for a fact check, you can uh, do that as well. Uh, so let's select the start time here and end time for that. Or like, let's do that. And uh, again, uh, let's put something very quickly. Let's give a claim date, check date, and add a source again. And uh, this is how you can add uh, multiple claims for a fact check. And uh, and before publishing, we can add uh, some excerpt. Uh, what, what the published date should be. And uh, you can add categories and tags like uh, in any CMS. And uh, you can add multiple authors. Again, categories, tags, and authors are uh, multiple. You can add as many as uh, you want to. And uh, once everything is done, you can pretty much publish it. And uh, this is where it shows uh, the two claims that we added and uh, we can uh, just go to a particular claim by clicking here and, uh, and you can navigate here. This is pretty much the preview for the fact check that we just added. And let's look at how uh, the published video shows up on uh, the user website. Uh, this is the one we just published and uh, this is how it will look for uh, the end user website where uh, again the, the end users can directly go through the list of claims here or uh, can just uh, jump to different claims and start playing and this is the description and review sources and uh, the information regarding the video 
and uh, the claims and different ratings and stuff. Similar features of the standalone WidCheck application are also available as a WordPress plugin. And this plugin will be available in the plugin directory soon. This is the interface for adding new fact checks in WordPress plugin, for example. Everything looks pretty similar. You can add the title, video URL here, and the video starts playing. And you can select the starting and ending time here. And you can add a claim based on that. And the interface here looks very similar to what we see in the standalone web application. As I mentioned earlier, WeCheck is also integrated with Factlist native CMS called Dega, which is an open source CMS focused specifically on fact checking and other news publishing organizations. Let's take a very quick look at what Dega CMS is. As you can see, Dega CMS comes with all the default entities and features that any CMS like WordPress would have, like posts, pages, categories, tags, etc. In addition to that, Dega is exclusively built for fact checking in the sense that there is a separate post type of fact check. It has structured entities like claims, claimant, rating, review, etc. The claim review schemas are generated automatically for fact checks published through Dega. Let's take a look at that. If you would like to know more about WidCheck or Dega the Fact Checking CMS, please write to us on our email hi at factly.in. You can also go through our documentation sites for WidCheck and Dega on the links that are displayed on the screen. Thank you. Hello. Thank you for joining Global Fact 8. And also thank you for attending FakeNet AI's presentation on deepfakes. I'm Raymond Lee, founder and CEO of FakeNet AI. FakeNet AI is a deepfake detection company. We service enterprises and consumers. Uh, we're started by a group of UC Berkeley founders and we've received generous support from the IFCN, Facebook, as well as a number of Berkeley accelerators listed here, including Big Ideas out of the Bloom Center and Berkeley Impact Venture Partners out of Haas School of Business. Today, we're gonna to talk about deepfakes, use cases, positive and negative, and how to detect deepfakes using visual methods and algorithmic methods. So deepfake technology is AI-generated media that looks and sounds incredibly realistic. It's advancing rapidly. So it's becoming more realistic. It's becoming faster to create and more accessible. You used to, you used to need to have at least a GPU or multiple GPUs to create a deepfake, as well as uh, having the uh, ability to code so that you could create a deepfake. Now you can simply go on the app store, download the app, and within seconds, introduce yourself into your favorite film. And there are positive use cases, but um, defects are also a powerful weapon for fraud, defamation, and disinformation. So I'll go through an example of a deep fake. This is a face swap deep fake in which the original actor's face is replaced with Tom Cruise's face. I'll play a clip. In this reel, you're gonna see my amigo, Chris Umi. <laughs> He's gonna to introduce to you the wonderful world of deep fakes. How so what's happening here is there's an original actor who has uh, similarities, characteristics similar to Tom Cruise. So similar face shape, similar body structure, as well as similar hairstyle. He also is impersonating Tom Cruise's voice pretty well. And what happens next is deepfake software is used to swap Tom Cruise's face onto his, making it appear as if it's Tom Cruise speaking to you. It's in fact a deepfake. In this real. In addition to video deepfakes, there's audio deepfakes. And this is powered by text-to-speech technology in which you can train a machine learning model on hours of speech as well as accompanying text and therefore generate speech using text as an input. Let's have a listen. 
That's something new to tell all of you. I've decided to sponsor a hockey team made up entirely of chimps. Sounds pretty realistic. So now deepfake technology has sparked the beginning of what some call the synthetic media revolution. Deepfake technology could revolutionize the way we generate and consume traditional media. And there's positive use cases. You can imagine that we can develop more engaging and relevant educational content or entertainment uh, because the cost to creating this content is significantly reduced. So what you can expect to see in the future is hyper-personalized content at scale. Another positive use case is the ability to de-identify media content and therefore protect individuals. There's a documentary called Welcome to Chechnya, which follows a marginalized group and tells their story. But the group in the documentary is protected because their faces are de-identified using deepfake technology. So they can tell their story uh, with less fear of being persecuted. And the viewer um, can view a more engaging face and therefore um, be more enthralled in the story uh, as opposed to looking at, uh, say, a blurred out face. So now there's negative use cases of deepfakes, as you can imagine. Uh, a fraudster used an audio deepfake to scam an executive out of $243,000. And in court, a plaintiff presented synthetic audio as evidence uh, in a child custody case to discredit the defendant and try to win the case. Deepfakes can also be used as, to, uh, as a form of defamation. So there's a famous case in Pennsylvania of a mother who allegedly used a deepfake to frame her daughter's cheerleading rivals. Prosecutors later dropped the fake video charges, but this gives an example or a glimpse of what could happen in the future. There's also several victims of deepfake revenge porn. And the problem with this is that speaking out may lead to more abuse, including victim blaming. And you can imagine that deepfakes can be a powerful tool for spreading disinformation and propaganda. In fact, the FBI is warning that a cyber attack is almost certain within the next six to 12 months. It's important now more than ever for enterprises and individuals to be prepared. So how can we identify deep fakes? One way we can identify deep fakes is looking for these artifacts that look like water splotches. Early deep fake generation models would introduce these artifacts, um, even though they would create very realistic images. Uh, so you can, you can use this uh, technique to spot a deepfake. It's important to note that newer deepfake generation models uh, are able to reduce the appearance of these water splotches. Another way to identify deepfakes is looking for background abnormalities. So deepfake generation models are focused on the facial area and therefore neglect the background, leading to some odd looking backgrounds. So we can see on this image uh, of this gentleman on left, uh, appears that their comrade uh, is sort of blurred out. Um, and you can see that's an artifact of the deepfake generation model. Um, in the middle, uh, you can see that in the background, there's some sort of cubic structure that looks kind of like a painting structure or something in between, uh, but some, not something that you would see uh, in real life. And on the right, you can see on the top right corner, there's something that appears to be, say, a mix of spider web and tree branches morphed as if they were one structure. So something that you wouldn't see in the real world. Um, and that's what, something you can use to detect deep fakes. One more thing, one more technique you can use to identify deepfakes is looking at eyeglass defects. So deepfake generation models have difficulty uh, with symmetry. And that's apparent in these eyeglass uh, photos. So the lady on the right, uh, she's wearing uh, Wayfair type glasses in which you'd expect her to have a matching bead on the top left of her glasses, which is missing. The gentleman in the middle, uh, you would expect him to have uh, the lens is on his left side holding up the glasses, but that's missing. And on the right, uh, the gentleman 
appears to have uh, a wooden type of texture on his edge on his right side, and then a sort of like a metal or steel uh, type of structure on his left side. Uh, so you can use these mismatches to identify deep fakes. And now that we've discussed ways to identify deep fakes, let's apply what we've learned so far. Let's think about those methods uh, that we uh, talked about earlier. So water splotches, abnormal backgrounds, uh, to name a couple. Um, which one of these photos is a deep fake? If you guess the one on the right, then you are correct. And you can see the water splotch indicated by the red arrow. So now let's talk about algorithmic detection methods. So there's high level methods and low level methods. High level methods are methods in which you identify semantically meaningful features. So I'll give an example of that. Uh, researchers out of UC Berkeley and USC. Uh, so Shruti Agarwal, Hany Fareed, Howley, they develop an algorithm that's able to detect whether or not the subject in the video is a deep fake or not by looking for head and facial movement signatures. So they essentially trained a machine learning model to understand an actor's mannerisms to determine whether or not it's really them in a video. Researchers from Berkeley and Stanford, uh, so Sruti Agarwal, Hany Fried, and out of Stanford, Ohad Fried, developed another type of model that looks for phoneme and visine mismatches. So phonemes are sounds that you make uh, are, are the sounds that, that an individual makes um, assigned to certain letters or related to certain letters. So um, the M sound, the B sound, the P sound uh, kind of sounds like mama, baba, papa. So that's, that's the phoneme. And the visime is the structure or the shape of the mouth uh, when an individual starts to make those sounds. So this image here demonstrates uh, the mouth shape that an individual would make before they start to make the M, B, or P, or mama, baba, papa sound. So deep fakes, deep fake generation methods struggle to match phoneme and visine, and researchers were able to use that to detect deep fakes. Now let's talk about low level detection methods. So low level detection methods rely on identifying artifacts, pixelations, or patterns that are common in deep fake videos. You can see in this image here, uh, this actor has an artifact near his nose area that is perceptible with the, with the human eye, uh, as well as this actor here. Now, artifacts may not be this perceptible in higher quality deep fakes, but nevertheless, the machine learning model is able to identify imperceptible artifacts, pixelations as well. On, on the bottom left here, we have a spectrogram of a synthetic audio uh, spectrogram or, or file, and then a spectrogram of uh, original audio file. So you can see that there is a distinct difference in the frequency and amplitude of the synthetic audio file uh, versus the original audio file. So machine learning model is able to take those two images as well as thousands more uh, real and thousands more fake images uh, to learn these patterns and therefore use that to detect deep fakes. So that's all for today. If you're interested in learning more, sign up for a free trial or demo at fakenetai.com. Go ahead and use this form and uh, enter in your info, hit submit, and someone from our team will reach out to you. Um, you can also use this form to sign up for our newsletter. Uh, simply just type in newsletter uh, in the message area and then we'll be able to add you to our newsletter list. We have a lot of exciting features and uh, content on the way. Uh, we're gonna have more in-depth tutorials and, and eventually courses on deep fakes and deep fake detection, uh, as well as a podcast. So if you sign up for the newsletter, you'll be informed of uh, when we release uh, our latest features and content. Uh, if you want to talk about deepfakes and you have any questions about deepfakes, feel free to reach out to me at raymond at fakenetai.com. You can also reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, my uh, my uh, username on LinkedIn is Ray Lee LinkedIn.
thank you for taking the time to join us. And uh, we hope you uh, found this valuable and we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you. Hello everyone, I'm Prerna Janeja, a fourth year PhD student at the University of Washington. In today's presentation, I'm showcasing the ongoing work that we are doing in collaboration with PesaCheck as part of the Fact-Checking Innovation Initiative grant program. I will talk about the tool that we are developing to automatically generate search queries related to important events and topics that need monitoring and are of interest to fact-checkers. Fact-checking broadly consists of five phases. First, fact-checkers continuously monitor social media platforms for potential false content. Once the fact-checkers have identified potentially false content on the internet, they identify claims in that content to fact-check. Once claims are identified, the fact-checker corroborates multiple primary sources to prove or disprove that claim. After the investigation, fact-checkers assign a label to the claim that reflects its veracity. And finally, the fact check is published. Out of all these five steps, social media monitoring is the most tedious step in the fact checking workflow. And currently, fact checkers monitor the social media platforms in four different ways. First, fact checkers monitor content reactively in response to users' reports and tips. Fact checkers also create watch lists and track social media accounts, groups, pages, and websites of repeat offenders that is, those who posted misinformative content multiple times in the past. And lastly, majority of the social media monitoring happens manually, where fact-checkers perform manual searches either on social media platforms themselves or on third-party tools. As part of our on ongoing project, we interviewed 22 individuals belonging to 14 fact-checking teams and organizations with representation from four continents, to understand how fact-checkers monitor various social media platforms. Those interviews revealed that while the amount of online misinformation is increasing exponentially, for the fact-checkers, searching misleading content mostly remains a manual task. In addition, generation of search queries that could lead to potentially dubious content is still based on guesswork and hidden trial method. The interviews also revealed that monitoring video search platforms are difficult and there are lack of good tools for platforms such as YouTube. So as part of our ongoing work, we ask whether we could automate the process of search query generation for fact checkers to assist them with monitoring social media platforms, especially video search platforms such as YouTube. As part of the ongoing project, we are developing a search query generation pipeline to assist fact checkers in searching content on YouTube. First, the fact checkers provide few misinformative videos for all the topics that they want to monitor. Then using the input videos provided by the fact checkers, we generate search queries using four methods. By using YouTube video tags, Google Trends platform, YouTube autocomplete suggestions, and the frequent words occurring in the description and transcript of the videos. We will discuss all these methods shortly. And lastly, the search queries generated by our tool are used to probe YouTube and the search results are presented to the fact checkers in a file. Now let's discuss the methods. In our first method, we are extracting and using the YouTube video tags from the misinformative videos initially provided by the fact checkers. Tags can be thought of as search words representing how content creators would like their videos to be discovered. In the example on the screen, you can see how a video claiming that Ebola is a hoax has used tags such as enemy of the new world order and red pill revolution. These tags can be further used as search queries to find more misinformative videos on YouTube. In our next method, we leverage Google Trends platform that contains Google's daily and real time search trends data. As the most popular search service, Google Trends are a good indicator for understanding real-world activities that impact a large number of people. Once you start typing on the Google Trends search bar, the platform will suggest the topics related to the word you have entered. The user then selects the country and the time period of interest. And then Google Trends presents the search queries related to the entered topic that most people have searched in the specified region and time period. 
we use these search queries to probe YouTube in our methodology. Lastly, we use the frequently occurring keywords in YouTube videos description and transcript to generate search queries. I'll quickly show you a demo for the tool that we are developing, which is a work in progress. Currently, the tool shows three methods of generating search queries. Fact checkers can select one or more methods. Next, they select the input file containing a few misinformative videos about the topic of interest. The files should be provided by the fact checkers prior to running the tool. As soon as they select the file, the tool will show a list of tags associated with the videos that the fact checkers provided. The fact checkers can navigate the drop down menu and select one or more relevant tags to form the search query. We can see that our tool used the tags we selected from the drop down menu, such as Enemy of the New World Order and Ebola hoax, to form the search query. Next, we ask the fact checkers to enter the number of YouTube search results that they want to collect for search query generated by our code. The fact checkers are notified once the search results corresponding to the query have been collected and stored. Next, we use Google Trends in our methodology. Our tool first determines candidates for Google Trends topic. For that, we extract the frequent keywords occurring in the title of the videos and present them as options to the fact checkers. The script then extracts Google Trends autocomplete suggestions for the keywords selected and present them as options. The fact checkers can then select one of the options presented to them or they can select the other option and manually enter the Google Trends topic. Next, fact checkers can select the country of interest. The all drop-down menu shows all the countries currently supported by Google Trends. The Africa menu shows an intersection of the countries that are of interest to PesaCheck and the ones currently supported by Google Trends. Next, the date range of interest is selected. Note that Google Trends has data from 2004 onwards. The script uses the entered parameters to extract five most popular and five least popular Google Trends search queries that are related to the misinformation topic to form the final search query, which is then used to collect search results on YouTube. In the third method, we use YouTube autocomplete suggestions. In this method, the script extracts YouTube autocomplete suggestions that will act as potential search queries about the topic. So first, fact checkers select one or more keywords then our script extracts the autocomplete suggestions from YouTube for the selected keywords and presents them to the fact checkers in a drop down menu from which fact checkers can select relevant search suggestions. And finally, our tool saves the search results. The final output file presented to the fact checkers contains several fields of the videos collected as search results. For example, video title, URL, search result rank, video type, number of views, etc. The work that I presented today is ongoing and we are currently building a web tool which can be accessed by fact checkers all over the world to search YouTube platform. We are also expanding the query generation methodology. For example, a lot of fact checkers rely on Twitter to accumulate the trending hashtags, which they later use as search queries on other platforms. We are also planning to add a functionality where the curated videos are compared to set of previously fact checked videos and only no videos are presented to the fact checkers. We will also add an artificial intelligence module that will highlight the credibility indicators in the video in order to facilitate the fact checking process. 
We are also working on presenting the YouTube search results in an interface that is similar to TweetDeck in order to make it easier for fact checkers to monitor various search terms simultaneously. Thank you for listening to our presentation. If you are part of a fact checking organization, or if you are an independent fact checker and are interested in using, evaluating and providing feedback on our tool, then please open the link that you see on the screen and fill out a Google form. Alternatively, you can also reach out to us via email or on Twitter to discuss more about our project. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Deji Adekunle, and I'm the team lead for Dubawa West Africa, a project of the Premium Time Center for Investigative Journalism. And I'm here to tell you how we've gone about institutionalizing a culture of fact checking in newsrooms across the region. Um, first, I'll start with a brief history. Um, Dubawa West Africa, like I said, is a project of the PDCIJ, and we are certified signatories of the IFCN Code of Principles. Um, we have offices in Nigeria, Ghana, the Gambia, Liberia, Sierra Leone, basically English-speaking West Africa to expand. And what do we do? Of course, like many others, we do fact checks, go further to do explainers, to write explainers, write media literacy and information literacy articles. And we've delved into a lot of research, kind of define the information disorder problem and prefer solutions. Um, and we do that through our IDAP project, which is basically Information Disorder Analysis Center. So we do research. Now, why did we decide to do to do what we did, um, institutionalize that culture across different newsrooms and media organizations, simply because of the shared scale of the information disorder problem. This and this information out there is, is just too much for one, two, or three, four organizations to deal with. Um, it's going on on a scale that um, requires a collective approach. And you have to also remember there's so many psychological and behavioral issues or common patterns that hinder the effectiveness of fact-checking in general, um, like, like cognitive bias, like um, the existence of um, hegemonous thoughts and, um, and partisanship in general. So what, 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 do, what do we then do? We have to be honest with ourselves and accept the fact that as much as we know what we're doing is vital and effective, we know we have a rich problem. This information is spreading through tech, it's spreading so much, we have to um, do, do a lot more to get, to get to where it's going and to go as far as the misinformation and disinformation is going, we have to cooperate. We all have to put our hands together, put our heads together, and face this global problem. And it transcends all media institutions in the future. We need a collective solution, because it's a global problem. And we decided to switch our model. The first thing we tried to do before we adopted the fellowship model was to go around training people. So we first had uh, a workshop kind of training where we brought in journalists and taught them fact-checking and verification skills. We even went to some newsrooms and um, engaged with them in their editorial comfort zones where we explained the whole process of fact-checking, verification, and shared tools with them. And we made sure that as an organization, as a platform, Dubawa was open to cross-publishing, um, sharing content, um, so we could, each, each, we could boost the reach for each um, platform doing fact-checking. That's the goal, cooperative growth. However, a couple of drawbacks were quite evident. One, when you go around from newsroom to newsroom training, you end up training people who have no interest in fact-checking and you can't force people to do what they don't want to do. Secondly, 
a lot of organizations didn't know how to implement. So how do I institutionalize that culture? How do I create a structure for fact-checking my usual? That was the question. That was the question for many organizations and they didn't know what to do. So we didn't, and we didn't provide solutions to that. So that was a drawback. And honestly, you, two, three days um, training sessions aren't really adequate to get people competent enough to battle this information and this information out there. So we needed to do more. And so we did what? We created a fellowship called, um, we started out as the Duba Fellowship. Now it's the Christian in the Kwame Karikari um, Fact Checking and Research Fellowship, uh, which, is, which is named after the great uh, freedom of expression, um, activist, and media scholar, Professor Kwame Karikari from Ghana. So we started by, of course, putting out a call. By putting out a call, First thing, we eliminate the lack of interest problem. But the unique thing about our call and our selection process is this. We made sure only by making sure they, they sent in a call, only interested people are applied. And we made sure that only people who sought the consent of their news organization could apply. So they had to come with a written letter to indicate that the organization is in support of them pursuing this new knowledge and this new enterprise and that they backed them throughout. So we made sure that they had that commitment down and before they could be selected. And of course we did the normal rigorous selection process. And then we had a four day kind of intensive workshop, very intense, more intense than what we even used to do before. Um, however, we didn't mind doing that because we knew we weren't going to leave train them and leave them to the wolves. We had a plan to engage. And that was that's the real activity of the fellowship. After the training, we now start the mentoring and cross-publication process, which means we have an editor who is also a mentor, not just an editor. And we also had a structure where other team members of the Dubar, Dubar team were available to help. So they had multiple people to reach out to for help when they had questions. Uh, we kind of walked them through the entire fact-checking process. Some people, the, ma the main victory for many journalists was doing their first fact-check. That usually um, is the most difficult part of the process. When they get one done, they are ready to push through the others. So we have to hold their hands throughout the fellowship to get things done. and. We encourage them to go out there as ambassadors, truth, truth call, to make sure that they are going out there spreading the gospel according to due power, uh, which is basically what truth verification. And that was by doing what they had to go out there, train their colleagues, train people, do a lot of media and information literacy in their circles, whether it be their own chapter of the journalist union in their location, um, in their local towns, or any other structures they belong to. We encourage them to spread that gospel, if I may say. And after it was all done, after the period, because we did this in a six month, a six month reporting period, um, we had a wrap up event where we awarded distinguished uh, fellows among them for performance and had each one of them tell their stories of how far they've come, the influence of the program, the impact on their newsroom. We even brought their editors to, to the event so they could speak from the organizational side of things. So that buying is key. It's one thing to train a reporter or a journalist to do something. It's another thing for the organization that reporter or journalist works for to support them in doing it. And that was what we did differently. Now, there are a couple of things you need to note when mentoring um, fact checkers. One, we all know fact checking takes more rigor and is a lot more, deals with a lot more scrutiny than normal reporting. So you have to help with the process. And how do we do that? We helped with the initial claim sourcing and identification, knowing what is checkable, what's not checkable, what is 
uh, a factual assertion and what's not. As simple as that might sound to you now because you're familiar, that is a real stumbling block for people who are just starting for young fact checkers. So we had to help send them claims to work on rather than just leave them to go scout and do the media, media management themselves. We helped, the editor helped, everyone on the table, and our audience engagement officer also helped with that. And then we made sure that no matter what type of media they work for, they, to help with the critical thinking part of the work, we had them write and helped them to build their writing skills. Sometimes we had to rewrite, make sure that we put comments or documents so they knew the editor corrections, the corrections done while editing. Normally, the newsroom process, no, no editor is going to tell you, tell you what he or she did usually um, to buff up your piece. However, this is a learning process. As much as we're creating content, it's really a learning process, and that takes priority. We made sure that that process was democratic. So most of the editing was done using Google documents. So comments were made, um, questions were asked, if the evidence, if the editor didn't feel the evidence was enough, the fact checker could argue their case. So, uh, which was, which is not normal, the normal editorial process. So you could argue your case and have a logical conclusion. So it's like a democratic process, which really thrives and depends on feedback. And constant communication is key. If someone's dropping, you have to check on the person. Are you doing okay? Sometimes the strain of expectation can quite overwhelm. So we made sure that that psychosocial help was there, get emotional support. If anyone felt anxious, overloaded, or was struggling with, um, with a little anxiety, we, we did whatever we could and there. That's the thing, we were present to help. And mental health is really key. And people can't learn if they are not feeling well mentally. So we have to provide that support. And then on the angle of the newsroom, we went as far as in some, some cases, paying courtesy visits and suggesting possible frameworks, right? You don't have to start your fact check desk, your newsroom as a full-fledged fact check desk, you might build it into some other structure. And different newsrooms came up with different, newsrooms came up with different ideas. And we encourage them to do it as free, in a flexible way and grow into it. Because there are logistic and operational consequences to changing your, your behavior in terms of content creation um, in your newsroom and your journalism. So we did not ignore that. We provided support through that process. And then we learned, we learned, we, we, we developed new workflows, provided more support uh, and procedures. Um, in the beginning, we weren't providing claims like we're doing now. We made sure that we each edition became better and we're sharing these learnings so that people don't have to go through the same process that we did. So we learned and created new flows and procedures. Um, we also took in other, um, we started out with just a few fellows which, which were print and online media, but, now, but then we, brought it, we increased our scope, brought in our horizon and went for broadcast too and bloggers too. So to make sure that we're teaching this to as many people as possible. After doing that, we also ensure that the participants came from the sub-regions, not just the major cities or capitals. Every single place is affected by mess and disinformation. So we ensured that we spread the reach by selection process. And that was really, really key for us. Um, and we got a couple of wins, right? Um, the last cohort alone, that was the... The, as we like to call them, the COVID cohorts had five fact check desks created in major newsrooms in the country. Um, we had new fact check radio and TV shows in different media um, because we encouraged our fellows to, to broadcast um, 
publish the way they would publish. So if you're a TV journalist, do a TV show. If you're a radio presenter, create a fact-checking section in your radio, on your radio station. So we allow that level of flexibility and it, it brought out a lot. People called in, were really grateful, said thank you. They were, they've always been hoping for a show like that. It was really, 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 really nice. And almost all, practically all participants trained, participants trained their colleagues. So they will call their colleagues in the newsroom, select a couple of people that they might or might not have been mentoring before and help them grow into being fact checkers. And, and through that process, a couple of them, through that process, got the fact check desks, desks created. And then, boom, people started getting promotions. I mean, we're very emotional at the last, last end, of, end of fellowship event because people got promoted, people's journalism ethics went way up, their performance went way up because of fact checking, it changed their lives. A couple of people got new jobs, joint fact-checking organizations. The transformation was not just at an, at an organizational level, but at an individual level. So we're touching lives, which is really, really, really a big deal. And of course, when we had to tackle events like the coronavirus, um, uh, misinformation, or elections, whether it be gubernatorial or regional elections or general elections, we could come together and cooperate and do more, create more. The fact that we're working together means there are more fact checks. The more, the better, which is the goal. If everyone is doing it, there is more coverage. There is more, and we're sanitizing public discourse. We achieved all of this by support, by getting support from the entire team, by having amazing fellows and amazing founders who understood what we're trying to achieve. Now, if you want to do this or you want to know a little more, please reach out to me um, via the chat rooms in the conference or on social media, or you can reach out to Duba in any way you want. There are a couple of phone numbers there. Um, our website is www.duba.org, and we've got Twitter handles, um, Facebook, and Instagram. So please, please reach out. I'd love all of us to get in on it. Let's do more. Let's create more impact and let's fight misinformation together. Thank you very, very much. Have a great conference. Why doesn't the media label lies by politicians as lies? I mean, just think about it. Politicians or netas tell lies all the time. As journalists, our job is to tell the truth. That's the question on Media Buddhi today. Hi, I'm HR Venkates. So that was the first in our series of videos that we began late 2020 all the way up to April 2021. It was for our Indian audiences in the languages of English, Hindi and Bengali. And it was all thanks to a grant from IFCN. But what is the reasoning behind these videos and what does media literacy, why is it important for the fact-checking community? That's the topic for the next few minutes. Media literacy journalism is for fact-checkers too. It's based on the work we've done at Media Buddhi at Boom. So here's a little bit about me. I'm, my name is HR Venkatesh. I'm the director of training and research at Boom, where I run the initiative called Media Buddhi and prior to joining Boom in 2019, I was the John S. Knight Fellow in Journalism at Stanford University. Uh, and I've been a journalist for several years before that as well. Here's what I'm going to cover in the next few minutes though. Uh, the first part is why media literacy journalism? Uh, the second would be what we did at Boom with this. The third part is what guidelines have evolved when it comes to media literacy journalism? And number four, what you can do should you wish to do the same thing or you want to swap notes with us if you're already doing the same thing. So the first question is why media literacy and why media literacy journalism? Back in 2018 at Stanford when I was focusing on 
uh, understanding misinformation and disinformation, I realized that there was a supply side and a demand side to the problem of misinformation and disinformation. Uh, and the supply side is very simple, right? We have, we are literally referring to the supply of mis and disinformation, and we fact checkers are pretty good now at uh, jumping on it and addressing it with our solutions. But what about the demand side? And specifically, when I speak, when I mean demand, I, you know, I'm referring to humanity's incredible appetite to believe in anything that is given to us uh, with a narrative that appeals to us. The best long-term solution, it appeared to me, was media and information literacy. Uh, the only thing, though, was MIL, as the field is known uh, officially, it was, was the domain of education departments at universities. Uh, journalists and fact-checkers usually did not get involved in media and, uh, uh, literacy, and by its very nature, it was also bespoke, given that only those who choose to opt for a course in media literacy can get trained or learn uh, media literacy. The need of the hour was different though, and that is a big uh, insight that all people should have access to this kind of training. Really, it's like having um, a, a license for the information highway, as Professor Sam Weinberg puts it of Stanford University. So the solution was, seemed clear to me. Journalists and fact checkers had to get into media literacy in a big, big way. This was the only way to scale it up. You can't scale it up through bespoke solutions at universities, but you can scale it up through the use of media. And not just scale, I'm talking about replicating it as well. Enter Media Buddhi. Um, our first step was to create Media Buddhi. Buddhi means wisdom or sense in multiple Indian languages. And we felt right at the get-go that we should take this across to as many languages as possible because there are Officially speaking, at least, there are 22 official languages in India. So what was our first step? Well, we started with a sub-stack. Uh, and the reason we did that was because we could build a direct relationship with our readers. And starting on the 20th of January, we, we, we do stuff like this. Yes, there is a such a thing as objective truth. We talk about journalism. We talk about how to tell propaganda, opinion news apart, how politicians manipulate us. And so essentially we've done several pieces about one a week for about almost more than a year and a half now. And so that was the first thing we did. Secondly, as the pandemic forced us all indoors completely, we continued our online workshops with senior citizens, kids, and all the people in between. So, so far we've developed modules, for example, on uh, WhatsApp, how do you uh, analyze sources on WhatsApp, what's news versus opinion versus analysis, propaganda, echo chambers. We've done more than this, but this is just an example I'm showing you. So we do these very basic uh, workshops, which are based on uh, polls and everything's got a an exercise kind of element to it and that kind of thing. So that was the second thing we did. And the third thing we did was we got the Media Buddhi grant, as I was saying. And we began Media Buddhi videos in English, in uh, Hindi, and in Bengali. Uh, once again, it was all about um, learning people how people can navigate the information ecosystem, such as this one, the 12 rules for WhatsApp groups. Uh, we did this, uh, as, as I just showed you in the beginning, but there's also uh, Hindi. <laughs> And then we did stuff on Bengali as well. So that's the kind of stuff we did with the videos. And as, as I said, we did more than 50 videos and we got, a, 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 you know, we got millions of views. We got a lot of people writing into us saying we should do more of this stuff that they really enjoyed our videos. And it is important for us that people were interacting with these videos in, in three languages. And of course, uh, with many more languages to go, we have a long way to go. But these three languages uh, account for some of the biggest, you know, speaking populations in India, specifically Hindi and Bengali as well. And then fourth, what we started doing was we started branching out into stuff around online safety. So this we put it on our website stories like 
how private is my VPN, which is actually a markup um, uh, piece that we've republished. We also do stuff on, you know, how to protect your computer from viruses, hackers, and surveillance. Uh, we do stuff like what's multi-factor authentication, four ways to be anonymous on the internet, and so on. And fifth, we started just very, very recently a series of uh, experiments uh, using really short videos. If our earlier videos were anywhere between six and nine minutes in length, these are just 60 seconds. Uh, and so we do it on Twitter, for example. This is one we recently did on reframing the fight, um, not as one against fake news, which we understand obviously is a problematic term, but as one of information pollution. So uh, we're doing series of videos on this. So we've done five things at least uh, with Media Buddhi and that brings us to our next section, which is five lessons we've learned. Uh, these are guidelines for media literacy journalism that we've evolved. The very first lesson we've learned is there's a huge hunger for media literacy journalism. Uh, our readers and our viewers appreciate uh, us telling them, you know, how to read the news, how meta narratives work, how proper propaganda, you know, is dispersed. Um, and, and there's this sense that of relief when, 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 when we do this kind of journalism and also when we couple these with workshops. The second learning is that media literacy journalism helps build communities. That's partly, I, I guess, because as fact checkers, we, we sometimes struggle to, um, to, to have an emotional hook for our readers uh, unless uh, readers themselves uh, believe that they should be truth seekers there isn't always an emotional connection, but media literacy journalism is made for communities, I would say, uh, with one caveat. So long as you do not uh, engage with them using highly polarizing content. Uh, we, if you see our videos and our uh, articles, we try to be as impersonal, neutral and impartial as possible. Uh, and, and that's because we find that people are better able to confront their own biases. Um, so long as we are not hijacking uh, their lizard brain uh, by referring to extremely polarizing content. Uh, the third lesson is that this is not about telling people what to think, but how to think. Um, it, I can't stress the difference more than this. The moment you start telling people what to think, you've lost them. And it also strays into the territory of opinion. And we like to avoid, uh, you know, getting into opinion as much as possible. And the fourth lesson I would say is that media literacy journalism isn't about finding facts or answers, unlike uh, us fact checkers uh, or what we do with fact checking, but it's about learning to ask the right questions. Uh, and uh, sometimes the methods are similar, but the ends are different. So, they're, they're, you know, when you when you write stuff, um, you know, you, you can use a similar kind of guideline system as fact checking, but the ends are different. And I'll explain what that means when we come to uh, point number five that it is possible to set journalistic guidelines for media literacy journalism uh, just like with uh, our guidelines with fact checks uh, it's not about telling people that hey this is a fact and this is not true it's more about telling people this is how we found the answer and you can follow the same you know you can follow our footsteps to find the find to come at the same conclusion similarly media literacy journalism is Again, as I said, it's not about telling people what to think. It's about laying a trail for people to follow with their own minds. And therefore, it lends itself towards building guidelines uh, on media literacy journalism. Okay, this brings us to our last section. What you can do should you wish to start a media literacy initiative of your own or if uh, you, know, you want to extend your existing one, you want to get into media literacy journalism. Uh, as we've chosen to dub it. So really there are two or three steps. The very first is look for collaborations with universities or professors. In my case, my journey started in 2018 with uh, Professor Sam Weinberg uh, with the Stanford History Education Group. And I did conversations with him, three or four of them, along with fellow fellows. And we all went our own ways. So it's not like we had exclusive access. But really, I would also say my journey started with Dr. Masato Kajimoto, uh, who did a workshop on media literacy and how to teach it uh, at, uh, you know, in Singapore, that was at the Trusted Media Summit in 2019. Uh, and he was tremendous. So was Samantha Stanley, his colleague, 
the two of them really kickstarted me on my journey. So reach out to them if you don't already know them. The thing, the second thing I would say is just begin somewhere, even if it's with a thread of tweets or a newsletter or, you know, if it's just one or two articles um, or whether you want to do videos as well, you can start anywhere and it's like a snowball, right? It's going to become bigger and bigger and bigger. And before you know it, you'll have a full-fledged initiative on your hands. And the third and final thing I would say is collaborate with us at Boom. We really look forward to learning from you and we believe that we do have something to teach as well. And really together we can make something of media literacy journalism, which I really think is the need of the hour uh, right now. And you want to get in touch with us. Uh, these are our contact details. Uh, there's me, that's my email address. There's the managing editor, Jensi Jacob. There's the deputy editor, Karen Ribello, uh, And there's Govind Raj Etiraj as well, who is the founder. And I'm just moving uh, the video here so that you can get the video very, very clearly. So that's it really from us at Boom and Media Buddhi. We're on our way. Let's create a movement for media literacy journalism. The world really needs it. And thanks for listening.